Well, good morning. So we're here at uh, the Jay Brook, my friend Bailey and I, and I wanted to show you getting outside is so important. What a beautiful day, blue sky. The leaves are just about to come out and there's all kinds of sounds and birds. And of course the gurgling water is a constant. But even if you just come to a beach like this and look at the rocks, all the different shapes and different colors and sparkles, lots for the imagination. But even more important is this stream. Even though you can't see it, the stream holds all kinds of secrets. And I wanted to ask you, if you were going to go swimming in this stream, would you know if it were polluted or not? Uh, you call the pollution monitor? Well, he's not around. How about the uh, dirty water fairy? Well, she's not here either. But what about if I told you that there are actually creatures that live in that water that can tell us whether it's polluted or not. So, what we'll do is we'll do some exploring. Alright, so you can see here there's a beautiful little stream and we were talking about the creatures that would be able to tell us if it was polluted or not. But before we do that, I just want to give you a quick tour of what, how to read a stream. It's not like a book, no words to it, but if you take a really careful look and look at the different configurations of how the water looks, then you can tell what's underneath it. Here you see there's here no, no white at all, and it sort of falls over rocks, and once it falls down, it's got bubbles, and that's because it has the air that's included in it, and that's why it's got the white. The white shows that it's air. If it's got rocks that it goes around, Further over, you can see that there are less bubbles because the water just flows around it and doesn't really include any air. If we move up this way, we can see that the rapids here are much higher because they flow over a higher rock and then when they hit the slower water, uh, they've got a lot of air included in it. These, this stretch of uh, river uh, are rapids, but if you look at it uh, where the water's a little calmer, then you can come up here and you can see up further up there, those are riffles because they're not white, but there are little waves in it and the water's much closer to, uh, or the top of the water is much closer to the bottom of the stream and uh, flows over the rocks, giving it little waves and things. So if you were to canoe this, you would have to be able to read it so you knew where the deep water was, where the air was, where the rocks were. So, uh, and this is where we're going to start looking for creatures. And obviously, just as we need uh, air to breathe, so do these creatures. And the included air in the uh, water is an excellent place to start looking for them. But before we do that, why don't we step over to the whiteboard and I'll tell you what we're looking for. So the uh, creatures that we're going to be looking for are known as benthic macroinvertebrates. Of course, macro, which is the opposite of micro, micro meaning very, very small, macro means large. But it doesn't mean huge like dinosaurs, it means large enough for the naked eye to see. Invertebrates, any idea? Well, if you take your forefinger and feel the back of your neck, you know that you've got vertebrae right there. And vertebrae are what keep you up. So if you don't have any vertebrae, oh my gosh, you just flop over. But invertebrates, they don't have any vertebrae, but what keeps them up? Insects, of course, have exoskeletons. So we're looking at big insects And then the only place that we've got, the only thing we've got left is benthic. Well, if we were looking at a water body and we looked at the top, and then there's the middle part of it, and then we've got the bottom. Any guesses? Of course. Benthic means bottom. So if we put it all together, we've got bottom living insects that are big that you can see with the, your naked eye. And that's what we're going to be looking for. 
And if I can take a minute, I'll show you some samples. So here are some of these creatures that we're talking about. This is a mayfly. And you can see it's the larval stages that actually live in the water. And then they emerge and they become fly insects that are in the air. Uh, notice that they've got really good gripping surfaces on their uh, little legs. And they've also got uh, gills uh, for air intake. Uh, so, you can see there's different shapes, different types, and some of these we'll take a look at. Oh, who doesn't know a crayfish? Snails. And then we've got the caddisfly. So, when we look at these, when we look at these uh, animals, uh, they have adaptations for the places that they live. And in this case, we're in a rapidly moving stream where the flow of water is very important. So if I were to sit on a rock and hold it and didn't have enough grip, what would happen to me? Ah, I'd flow down the river, end up down in Enosburg or something. Well, I had to learn how to hold on. And then the other thing is, if you're trying to go, if anybody skis or snowboards, if you're trying to beat your friend, what do you do? You go right down low and you get really so that the wind doesn't hold on to you. Well, in a stream, you want to do the same thing. It's not wind, it's water. And if you stood there like that, you'd get blown right over. So you want to be aerodynamic or fluid dynamic. And so you have a very low profile. So there are bugs that have very low profiles that can head into the water and not worry about it. And then the other thing that you want to do is if you don't have either one of those adaptations, you build yourself a little house. And you stay in that house and you let the water beat against the walls and you say, ha ha, you can't get me, you big bad wolf. Oh no, we're not doing three little pigs. Uh, you can't get me water. And uh, the caddis fly actually uses, in running water, uses little pebbles that he puts together with silk uh, and makes his, uh, makes his own little house that he sits in. And every so often he sticks his head out, grabs some food, eats it, goes back into the house. So, I, in Vermont, I guess with cold water, he might have to have a chimney and a wood stove. But we'll see. Let's go down to the water and see if we can find anything. There are so many interesting things about nature we talked about benthic macroinvertebrates, but I wanted to let you know black flies are those nasty gnats that we all keep banging on our arms and blood suckers that they are. So gnats, black flies love living in water like this, uh, as opposed to mosquitoes that live in still water. The black flies will sit on the bottom of the uh, river, hold on to the rock and eat things that are brought down to them. So the river actually brings food to these insects. Um, and what happens is the black fly hates to get wet. So when it's a larva, it notices, it knows when it wants to uh, molt or uh, change, morph. And what it does is it gathers up air bubbles and puts it around itself. And then when it builds a complete air bubble, it steps into it and goes up into the surface of the river and ta-da! comes out of the air bubble without ever having gotten wet. Uh, pretty neat if you get a big magnifying glass, maybe you'll catch it. Put your head underwater and watch for it. Um, so we're going to go into the river and try and, and, try and find some animals. Um, we're using a net that has a special name. If anybody can guess, take a look at the shape and it looks like a D, doesn't it? The letter D. And so the flat part of the D is actually the part that you put onto the bottom of the river, like that. And then what you do is you stand two feet upriver. When I say upriver, that means you're standing above it where the water flows down this way. And the reason why is because what you're going to do 
is you're going to do the twist like Elvis Presley and move your feet so that you agitate the bottom of the riverbed and any of the creatures that are holding on to the rocks or hiding in the rocks will be swept into the net. And then you lift it up, you check what you've got, you have to be surprised when you catch that whale, and now you're able to get your sample and see what you've got. Let's go into the river and see if we can catch anything. So, we just walked up the stream from the rapids to the riffles, where it's a little quieter and the animals don't work, have to work so hard. If you noticed while we walked, I used my net as a walking post. Never put the net down on the ground and push off on it like that. Always walk with it this way, because otherwise you're gonna damage the net and it won't do you any good when you wanna catch the animals. So, remember what I said? It's a D-net. The flat part goes onto the floor of the, of the bed of the river and you stand upstream about uh, a foot or two away and do your best impression of Elvis Presley by trying to roil up the bed and have everything go into the net. And as you can see, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, debris that flows. And you take it and you bring it up and you look in and you go, Look what we've got. You want to put your hand in? No. What you do is you take a look. Don't forget, these animals are fragile. And even though you have caught them in the net, you don't want to grab them with your hand. And you take them like this, and you go to the bucket that you have prepared, and you drop them in. So, uh, and then once you've dropped them into the bucket, you can take a magnifying glass or uh, um, egg carton. Um, I'll show you some of the things that I use for closer examination. But let's try that again because the whale we caught the last time wasn't quite big enough. When you lift it up, if you see, they can be very, very tiny, so you want to make sure that you take a very close look. And in this case, we really didn't catch anything. The other thing too is, if you don't want to use your net, you can also go down and check underneath the rocks to see if there are things that are clinging to it. And in uh, many cases, uh, you'll find little animals scrambling. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my net aside And then we'll try and see if we can find something underneath the rocks. What you want to do is you want to check if you can find a river, a rock that is against the current and give some sort of protection. So this one right here is a good example. It's lying against the current and perhaps underneath it there might be something that's hanging on to it. There isn't on this case. And we have to keep looking because it's early in the season and we don't necessarily have anything yet. But you can see there are things that started building some little houses. And let's see if we can find some others. Nothing yet. I did come out and have one earlier on, but I don't know where that rock was. So you can see little eggs and things here, and these will grow and become full-fledged little animals. Caddisflies, most probably. Let's see. We'll try one more, and if not, Ah, so here again, little eggs, but no actual animals running around yet. These little rock debris then become the little pebbles that the uh, caddisfly weaves together with its silk to make a house. So, and what you look for is in the surface when you lift it, uh, lift the rock out, 
in the smaller ones, you'll actually find bigger ones later in the season, but the small ones will shimmer across this wet surface and they'll always try and look for um, darkness or shade because they don't like this being in the sun. So. Oh, there's one. See the little one? And these are caddisfly houses. You can see the pebbles that have been glued together. And what I can do is see if I can open it up and see, show you. So there. One of the creatures that we found out there in the rapids was a caddisfly. And I had shown you the little houses that they build. In the river, take a look at the one on the right in the circular uh, petri dish. And you can see the caddisfly. It's a little smaller than the actual uh, larva because it's dried out. And then it made a cocoon of rock. So that's in a stream. And on this side here, you can see the caddisfly. This is in liquid, so the caddisfly is actually not dried out. And this was using um, branching uh, vegetal, uh, vegetative material from a pond. Uh, and here in this drawing, you can see the caddisfly comes in and out uh, of, the, of the cocoon, which is uh, held together with um, silk uh, that the, uh, the uh, larva had spun. And he comes out to uh, grab uh, whatever food floats by. Uh, usually the larva is about two to three weeks and then it emerges from uh, the stream as an adult uh, caddisfly and has another week or so of life in which term, uh, time it then um, lays eggs and repeats the cycle. Notice also the one up here in the corner. This will be important when we talk about a pollution index. So now we also have water bodies that are, we've been talking primarily about streams and running water, but we also have water bodies that are still, such as ponds, lakes, um, and in this case, the giant water bug that you see here is a uh, pond creature. And pond creatures don't need the grappling hooks that creatures that live in um, fast-moving water need. But what it does need is it needs some sort of snorkel because when it lives in still water, uh, it has to get its air uh, oxygen from the outside above the water. These animals are much more adapted to uh, water that is not as clean. And again, if you look at the number three up here in the corner, we'll get to what that index means. But compared to the caddisfly, which was a one, this is a three. These animals are also known as toe biters and are found in uh, ponds, usually along the shore on vegetation. And if you do step on them, they will tweak you and uh, you'll feel it. So uh, they are uh, scavengers and uh, predators and uh, quite impressive. So when you go, uh, I've only shown you a couple of uh, samples. Uh, but there are many invertebrates uh, in, the, uh, in the different uh, bodies of water. And I wanted to show you that you can uh, pick up, if you go on the internet, you can pick up flashcards. And these flashcards actually have the various animals and their life cycles and requirements uh, in great detail. And one other thing that you would need is a bug box, which is simply a uh, one inch by one inch plastic container and it has a magnifying uh, top to it that you can then put the animal in, put the top on and see a larger, uh, see the detail, which makes it really good for identification, for drawing and all kinds of activities that need magnification. So dragonflies um, are also part of these benthic macroinvertebrates and they live both in rushing streams as well as in ponds. 
And here you see the larval form of the uh, dragonfly as it crawls around on the water, in the water. And when it's ready to uh, morph, it uh, climbs out onto a grass or reed or stem, clamps onto it, and then splits it back and uh, withdraws from the uh, skin that it had below, changing into the dragonfly that we know. The wings are uh, blown up with um, blood, well, the insect serum or sera. And uh, interesting thing about the dragonfly is that each eye, it has compound eyes, and each eye is made up of uh, 3,000 little screens. So it can see multiple images uh, as it hunts. Uh, it can only eat when it's flying. And um, so if it has to land or if it's, uh, if its wing gets broken or something and it can't fly and it can't eat. So that, those are interesting uh, things that you can also look up on the internet and they actually have video of a dragonfly larva hunting. So if you remember back to when we started this I was telling you that these creatures could tell you whether the water was polluted and whether you wanted to swim in it or if it was clean. And here's how we do it. On this sheet, you can see right up here, group one taxa, group two taxa, and on the flip side, it has group three taxa. Those correspond to the numbers that we saw in the corners that I pointed out with the various um, animals that we saw the diagrams of. So for example, group one taxa, there's the caddis fly, and it was a one on the picture that we had, which means that this is pollution intolerant. So if the stream had any kind of uh, pollution, you would not find these animals. Group 2 taxa is pollution tolerant, uh, meaning that it can get some pollution, but it is in between. And then group 3 is definitely polluted water. So if you find, uh, you can find pollution intolerant in good water, but you will not find it in polluted water. And, but you will find pollution tolerant in clean water as well. So you then go to another form here and if you take and see how many uh, samples you find and you multiply or manipulate them, it gives you an index and that will then tell you what the water quality index is of that body of water that you've surveyed. Uh, you can do this at different times of the year, you can do it in different sections, uh, and it gives you a lot of valuable information just using the natural stuff that you have there without having to carry uh, a chem kit or uh, uh, any kind of microscope or anything like that. And if you want to jump into the water with your friends because it's a hot day, check out the animals that you have and then you know you're good to go. Have a good day and do some exploring.